Good afternoon. Uh, I was going to say we're going to have to try that again. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yay! Thank you very much for indulging me. My name is Amanda McMullen. I'm the president and CEO here at the New Bedford Whaling Museum. And it is an absolute delight to welcome you all to the 120th annual members meeting of the Old Dartmouth Historical Society. Welcome. So as we look back on 2022, you're going to see that we had a pretty fantastic year. I am incredibly proud of our staff, our volunteers, and our trustees. Each and every one of you played a critical role in advancing our work and navigating these uncertain days. Thank you. I am also forever grateful to our members. Because of your continued support, the museum increased our ability to welcome, engage, steward, and thrive. And the museum's success, frankly, is the community's success. In fact, last year we commissioned an independent study to examine just how much of an impact does it make when the museum is thriving. And amazingly, this independent research study concluded that every single year, the New Bedford Whaling Museum contributes over $10 million in economic impact to the region and the city of New Bedford. How about that? Yeah. Importantly, this study also concluded that visitors to the Whaling Museum annually, thousands upon thousands of people who come through our door actually go out our door and spend close to $3 million in our neighbors' shops, the restaurants, and they fill the hotels. So that's also pretty fantastic. And so today, as we celebrate 120 years, it's a big birthday, of course, we wanted to be able to take a look back with a great video to give you a sense of what 2022 really looked like. Enjoy this. To take a moment to consider the museum experiences over the years and how they have shaped you and how they shape the way you engage in the world. You might recall an aha moment, a transformative moment, an exhibit or an artifact that led you to see things differently and recognize that a work of art could be a puzzle to solve uh, or a question to be answered. Twenty twenty two was the year to return to the New Bedford Whaling Museum. Seventy thousand five hundred and ninety two visitors walked through our front doors from all fifty states and as far away as Australia. It's about the birth of horticulture, about the beginnings of botany in the United States. We offered fifty one public programs. 18,306 participants attended our virtual and in-person public programs. 237,000 visitors visited the museum's website and over 700,000 people visited the museum's social media channels. The museum debuted eight rotating exhibitions including The Art of Domingo's Rebello, Sailing to Freedom, and Reframing the View. 95 artifacts have been preserved by our conservation team. 273% increase of K-12 students served by museum programs. 12 high school apprentices participated in story collection for the museum's oral history project, Common Ground. 100% of senior apprentices graduated from high school and were accepted into two-year or four-year institutions. The museum served 804 scholars in the library reading room. The museum's membership included 2017 households and business members. 25 members traveled to the Azores for our first members trip since 2019. We will work together to develop a vision for this institution in service to our community. And over the course of more than a century at New Bedford, you have increasingly perfected the realization of that mission by serving more and more different constituencies within the larger community. How about that? 
Pretty good? That's a good year, right? Well, good year is made possible by good people. And um, I have been, uh, I've been at the museum for five years, and I was hired by my partner in crime, if you will, Tony Sapienza, who is the board chair. And there's no way you're going to get through these last five years if you don't have an extraordinary partner in the effort. So I want to invite Tony Sapienza, the chair of our board, to come on up and take us through the business meeting. Thanks, Tony. <laughs> well, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Amanda, so much for having such a great turnout for our annual meeting. It's been one hell of a 2022 year, and we can certainly all be proud of it. And 2023, I think, is already off to a record pace, and we are very excited about all of the things that are going to happen in 2023. As members, you all know the critical role you each play in helping the museum achieve great heights. You also play a key role each year at the annual meeting in approving our trustee nominating process. To do this, I would like to ask for a motion to open the voting portion of the 120th annual meeting of the Old Dartmouth Historical Society. Is there a second? Any, all those in favor? Are there any opposed? Oh good, we don't have to go home then. We can stay for a while. <laughs> the motion carries and we will open the meeting. Um, I, I now pronounce the 120th annual members meeting of the Old Dartmouth Historical Society open. I would also like to ask for a motion to accept the agenda as noted in your programs shared through our invitation. Is there a motion and a second? Are there any opposed? Any opposed? No? Good. The motion, are there all those in favor, please? Uh, the motion carries. Uh, let's move forward to the presentation of our financial review and the governance updates for your votes. Good afternoon, and welcome to the members of the Old Dartmouth Historical Society. I'm Tony Sapienza, Chair of the Board of Trustees. 2022 has been a challenging year, but with so many opportunities for us to look forward to. I'm pleased to welcome Wick Simmons, the Treasurer of our Board, and Michelle Taylor, the Chief Administrative Officer of the Museum. Thank you, Tony. Before I turn things over to Michelle, and she'll cover the detail of our 2022 uh, financials, uh, a couple of highlights that I'd, I'd like to note. The first is that for the first time since 2019, the pre-pandemic pre year, we actually exceeded our revenue total for that year by roughly 8%. That's a big victory to us because, as you well know, and I saw this in the journal the other day, that foot traffic in most major cities in the United States is still down 27 to 30 percent from what it was in 2019. So for us to come up with a revenue 8 percent positive uh, this year as opposed to 2019 is a big victory. Uh, well done, Amanda. Second thing I want to note is that we continue to have a very strong balance sheet. And that balance sheet gives us certain freedoms uh, which we take. One of which is, in a year of steadily rising interest rates, we have no borrowings, uh, which makes for a much less expensive overall carry for us uh, than perhaps for some others. Third thing I'd mention is that that same strong balance sheet gave us the ability to run, for the first time in 10 years, a roughly 10% deficit. Uh, and that, we, that was a deficit that we chose to run simply because we wanted to round out our full staff and, of course, pay inflationary wages. At the, at the same time, uh, we wanted to add to the marketing expenses that we've had because we built some real momentum in the year 2022, and we didn't want to see that dissipate as we moved on into 2023. One final note, and it's a little different, uh, is the fact that we did put our audit account up for review last year. Now, this is something that most companies do every once in a while. We hadn't done it for 10 years because we're so satisfied with the auditor we have. So we put it up for review. We had invited two other firms in. And interestingly enough, our current auditor, Alan Smith, came out the champion once again. So we're proud that we did that. And we just want you to know that we're looking after those details of governance uh, as well as the finances of the firm. 
As I look forward to 2023, we've gotten off to a very good start. Moby Dick built some real momentum for us just after Christmas, and we've carried that through the first four months of the year. That's very heady, and of course, we've still got a long way to go. At the same time, 2023 is also a year in which we're going to have to do some significant capital strategic planning because, as all of you know, uh, that 11 William Street lot is waiting for a building on it, and we've got to figure out just how we're going to raise the money that's going to enable us to do that. That's going to be a major 2023 project. So let me stop there, but first let me say one other thing, and that is I want to thank all of you as our members and contributors for continuing your support as you have uh, these last two or three years, particularly in this last year. It keeps us going, as you well know, because roughly 70% of our income in any year is contributed income. So we can't live without you. I also want to say thank you to Michelle, Amanda, and the rest of the staff because they executed our plan so well last year and enabled us, as I say, in a difficult year to run just a small, balance, just a small deficit and maintain a strong balance sheet. So, Michelle, I'll let you pick up things from here. Thank you, Wick. Not only did the museum achieve important financial results within its operations, but we also concluded a successful campaign that added $644,000 to our endowment in 2022. The endowment ended at $16.4 million. Additionally, the museum raised more than $2.5 million towards the planned expansion at the adjacent 11 William Street property, which was acquired in 2021 without any debt. The museum's balance sheet remains strong with $34 million in net assets. Once again, the museum has earned the highest GuideStar Platinum Seal and the highest four-star rating from Charity Navigator for financial health, transparency, and accountability. Like WIC, let me express my deep appreciation to our members and supporters. Thank you. Good afternoon. I am Tricia Shade, and it's been a pleasure to serve as the chair of the Governance Committee for the museum this year. The Whaling Museum's Governance Committee is charged not only with nominating a terrific class of new trustees, but also to serve as a guidepost for the health and direction of the Board of Trustees. Members should take great confidence in the Board's oversight in the Museum's efforts to fulfill our objectives. With this spirit, I am very proud that we continued to accelerate the Museum's commitment to diversity, equity, accessibility, and inclusion. The New Bedford Whaling Museum has taken many important steps in DEAI, and I am pleased that our trustees are leading the way on this. In looking forward, the Governance Committee paid important attention to our nominating process. I have the distinct honor on behalf of our Governance Committee to present a terrific slate of officers, the renewal of a second term for two outstanding trustees, and out forth five dynamic new trustees for their first term. In a moment, membership will be invited to cast your support for these votes. Before that, I want to underscore my thanks to the Governance Committee members. I would also like to express my heartfelt appreciation for those outgoing trustees who have helped us so much over the past many years in a time of great uncertainty. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle, Wick, and Tricia, for your reports today. Thank you to the members for attending today and being such staunch supporters of the museum. We're all looking forward to 2023. I want to say again, thank you to Wick Simmons as our treasurer for this past, the past year and the chair of the Finance Committee, and to Tricia Shade for chairing the Governance Committee. Their reports are very important to this meeting's agenda today. So in addition to any proxy votes that were submitted by members, I will ask for a show of hands to conduct our voting process. All in favor of, showing, of having a voting process? Okay, very good, thank you. Um, We'll now vote to approve the class of 2026 new trustees that Tricia presented in her governance report. They are uh, Susan Costa, Betsy Fallon, Jim Hughes, Michael Moore, and Lucy Rose Correa. Do I have a motion for the, to nominate this slate of new trustees? And is there a second? Are there any nominations from the floor? There being none, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Are there any opposed? 
There being none, the motion carries. Congratulations to our new trustees. I would now ask for a motion to approve the reappointment of two trustees, both Meg Howland and Lloyd McDonald. Do I have such a motion? So moved. And a second? Second. All, all those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? There being none, the motion carries. Lloyd, Meg, welcome back aboard. <laughs> For our final vote of the proposed officer's slate, I would like to ask Tricia Shade to preside over the, over the meeting. Thank you, Tony. So I have the privilege of presenting the 2023-2024 slate of officers. Do I have a motion? Is there a second? second. Are there any nominations from the floor? All those in favor? Are there any opposed? Hearing none, the motion carries. I want to thank the membership for your approval of our 2023-2024 officers. Now I'm pleased to ask the board chair, Tony Sapienza, to preside over the meeting once again. Thank you, Tricia, and thank you for your votes uh, in electing me again to another term as the uh, chair of this board. It's an excellent board of trustees, and it is indeed a deep honor for me to be able to serve as its leader and to partner with Amanda as we go into the 2023 year. So thank you, thank you very, very much. Um, to conclude our governance process for the year, I want to ask for any motions from the floor. Is there any new business from the floor? There being none. Um, I would like to get a motion to close the 120th annual members meeting of the old Dartmouth Historical Society. And there's there a second? second. All those in favor? Aye. Is anyone opposed? Hearing none, I will pronounce the business portion of the meeting closed. Let me express again my appreciation to you, the members of the old Dartmouth Historical Society for your attendance and for your confidence in our leadership of this great institution. Let's move on now to the bittersweet moment of our meeting to thank our outgoing trustees. The Whaling Museum has always benefited from the wisdom of leaders in our community. We are deeply grateful for their dedication and leadership. I'd like to have Amanda and Allison assist me in presenting to those here today with an original print of the cupola by local artist Roy Raza, Raza, let me say it properly, Raza. And um, so first and foremost on that list, let me see here, I'm losing my track of this paper. Oh, there we go, sorry, here we go, yeah. Um, so please join me in recognizing decades of service by Vanessa Gralton. Kathy Roberts. Tr Trisha Shade. And Dr. Christine Schmidt. Unfortunately, four other departing trustees could not be here today, but I want to honor them as well and may re reiterate their names. Onesimo Almeida, Thomas Anderson, Robert Kelly, and Per Lofberg. This has been, a, 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 as I said earlier, it's a bittersweet moment because these nine trustees have been so active, so engaged, and so much a part of the work that we have done over the last 10 years. So thank you all again for the work that you have done for this museum. Um, uh, I think she's there, okay, good. <laughs> she's not, okay, good. Um, so I would like, to, um, it, it should come, first of all, I, I would like to um, 
acknowledge that an important part of the Whaling Museum is our team of volunteers and our volunteer council. Our volunteers and docents are the backbone of our vibrant learning programs and significantly contribute to positive experiences for our visitors on a day-to-day -day basis. Nancy Gentile has served as volunteer council president for the last three years. And what a three years they have been. You can well imagine how difficult the volunteers' jobs have been during the pandemic when we've had all kinds of disruption, all kinds of things that we had never thought would ever occur, and our volunteers have been absolutely magnificent in helping us on a day-to-day -day basis. <laughs> I'd like to honor Nancy today, but she can't be with us, and, and the reason is, well, it should come as no surprise that Nancy and fellow docent Mike Taylor are doing a, quote, day in the life of the Lagoda at the Falmouth Public Library. That's why they're not here. <laughs> and it's absolutely typical of their commitment to, to our museum and the work that we do. So uh, it just shows how, how, her, how dedicated she is. Um, I want to thank her for her incredible service. And I want to also welcome Bob, Bob Saltzman as the incoming volunteer council president. Bob, where are you? There he is. Okay, thanks again to Nancy. We will send a gift to Nancy when, she, when she's available here in town. Um, I'm now pleased to welcome the Douglas and Cynthia Crocker Endowed Chair for the Chief Curator and our Director of Museum Learning, Naomi Slip. Thank you, Tony. Um, so, uh, hello. Uh, <laughs> it's a pleasure to see everyone. Um, as Tony mentioned, my name is Naomi Slip. I am the Douglas and Cynthia Crocker Endowed Chair for the Chief Curator and Director of Museum Learning here at the New Bedford Whaling Museum. Um, in December of 2021, some of you may remember, we opened an exhibition in the Waddles Gallery called Unvarnished, Conservation of Charles Sidney Raleigh's Panorama of a Whaling Voyage which aimed to tell the story of our second panorama painting, created between 1878 and 1880 by the prolific British-born artist Charles Sidney Raleigh. Now, many museum members, I am sure, are familiar with our 1,275-foot-long painting, The Grand Panorama of a Whaling Voyage Around the World, painted by Benjamin Russell and Caleb Purrington around 1848, conserved in a massive undertaking and exhibited in 2018 to spectacular effect. However, some of you may not be as familiar with the fact that we own a second historic panorama painting, a 275 foot long painting of 22 whaling scenes following the 1870 to 74 voyage of the ship Niger, one of the last great whaling vessels of the time. Now, panorama paintings were popular entertainments. They were exhibited widely uh, and rose to prominence in the United States starting in the 1840s. They were often accompanied by dramatic music, stage dressing, and narration. And both static and moving panoramas, which we have examples of each, engaged audiences' imaginations and offered an exciting and sometimes lurid experience in the days before cinema. These were a hugely popular entertainment. These paintings were made at a monumental scale, but they were meant to be portable. Hence, they were made more like theater backdrops on loose canvas with paint, and they traveled the country, sometimes crossing oceans, uh, creating incredibly exciting events. Today, panorama paintings are extraordinarily rare. That might sound surprising because I just told you we have two. <laughs> um, but there are actually only eight known panorama paintings in US public collections today. So if you do the math, we have 25%. The two at our museum are right in there. Now, after being exhibited publicly in 1905, our Raleigh panorama was donated to the museum in 1918. It was given to us on a single roll of canvas, and in 1958 was cut into smaller sections to make it easier to move around. The museum contracted in the 1960s with a conservator based out of Boston, Gustav Kleiman, who trimmed the paintings and mounted them with adhesive, as we will learn, onto very heavy aluminum panels. And in fact, when we dug into the object records, they were actually using uh, airplane-grade aluminum in some cases. <laughs> 
Now, the museum operated with best intentions, and Kleiman was an expert in the field. Um, but one of the underlying uh, outcomes of this was that the paintings each today weigh about 250 pounds. They are enormous, heavy, hard to move. Did I mention they're 12 feet wide and about six feet high? Um, so they're very big, and we have struggled as a museum to care for them. The 2021 exhibition that I mentioned, Unvarnished, aimed to underscore the challenges museums face in dealing with large collections and unusual objects. And a second goal was to raise funds for the conservation of these paintings and preserve them for generations to come. And in this, the exhibition was a true success. As today, the first panel in the series is being conserved by Gianfranco Pocobene Studios. As Gianfranco will share this evening, the conservation of this painting is no small feat. This will, as I understand, be the largest aluminum panel reversal ever undertaken and is a highly complex process. We're very excited to partner with Gianfranco Pocopene Studios in this groundbreaking conservation effort, which will lead the way for similar projects at this scale around the country. Gianfranco Pocobene Studios' conservation work on the museum's panorama panel was made possible by members and donors, like all of you. If you remember the exhibit, there was a QR code where you could donate to the effort, and, and that is being put well to use, as well as a major grant through the Save America's Treasure Program, which is funded by the National Park Service in collaboration with the Institute of Museum and Library Services, the National Endowment for the Arts, and the National Endowment for the Humanities. So, it is now my pleasure to introduce Gianfranco Pocobene, who holds a BA in Fine Art from McMaster University, an MA in Conservation from Queen's University, and an Advanced Certificate in Paintings Conservation from the Strauss Center for Conservation and Technical Studies at the Harvard Art Museums. Gianfranco has built an illustrious career as a paintings conservator, especially in the Boston area, where he has served as a research conservator for the MFA Boston, as conservator of paintings at Harvard Art Museums, and where he currently serves as chief paintings and research conservator at the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum, where he's responsible for the conservation and restoration of the paintings collection, with emphasis on the technical research and related activities of that division. He's also acting principal at Gianfranco Pocobene Studio in Malden, Mass., where he specializes in the conservation of easel paintings, from private and institutional collections like ours and murals in public and private buildings. Gianfranco's resume includes an incredible number of impressive projects and specialties, but a few stand out in relation to our panorama project that I wanted to highlight. He was project director of the restoration of the John Lafarge murals and decorations in Trinity Church, and was project supervisor of the conservation and restoration of John Singer Sargent's Triumph of Religion mural cycle at the Boston Public Library. So no stranger to big <laughs> projects. More recently, Gianfranco has made something of a specialty of treating and reversing aluminum sheet interleafs and panel mounting, like our project, with papers on this topic presented at international conferences, including the American Institute for Conservation Conference in 2019. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to our keynote speaker for the 2023 annual members meeting, Gianfranco Pocobene. I got this twice. Great, thank you. Uh, what a pleasure to be here this evening, uh, afternoon, evening, and um, it really is an honor talking about this really exciting project for us. Um, Naomi sort of set the, the uh, background to the, to the project, and what you see here is the, um, the painting that we're working on in the studio, and as she indicated, it's uh, just about 12 feet wide and a little over six feet high, and it's on this aluminum uh, support. Now, I want to want to say uh, right off the bat, it's always easy to go back and uh, in history and say, what a terrible job they did in the past on such and such a thing. We, we can do that with anything pretty well. And one of the things I want to uh, emphasize is that in the mid 20th centuries, the, let's just say the uh, from the 1930s to the 1960s, 70s, there was a lot of experimentation going on with how to treat and preserve objects. And a lot of it had to do with the fact and we take it for granted now, is that there was no climate control in any museum. So a lot of these objects that were being collected, paintings, uh, wherever they came from, are now in, in a new environment, and a lot of issues came up with them splitting, cracking, uh, paint flaking off. And restorers, conservators, were trying to find ways to preserve them. Um, 
In some cases, like this one, Gustav Kleeman went a little overboard, but the intentions were not to try to ruin the paintings. Um, am I doing this right? Is it gonna, oh, there it goes. Yeah, and here are uh, some photographs uh, actually of Kleem. Just, uh, just a little touch, I'll get, I'll get it figured out. Mm. Okay, one, stop there. See if it does anything. There it is, okay, a little delay there. So here you see Kleeman with one of the paintings actually uh, being hauled up into, one, into his studio in Boston. And I believe he's the gentleman on the left uh, in, the, in the photograph where they're uh, restoring the painting here. Um, so what he did was, um, again, a lot of experimentation. And with some of this work that he was doing, he was actually taking patents out on techniques of doing conservation and restoration of paintings. Not that there was gonna be a huge market and make a killing on, you know, this, this technique, uh, it's a very limited kind of application, but he wanted to take ownership of it. Um, so here are some images just showing that, you know, the, the, the patents that he had taken out on some of his uh, uh, techniques. Um, this is the, uh, the back of the painting uh, in our studio up in Lawrence, Massachusetts, and you can see this, um, this structure of uh, uh, four panels of, uh, of uh, airplane grade uh, aluminum that's, that are riveted together, and I think you can see the, uh, the joins here, and then surrounded by this wood lattice kind of support to hold it all together. And what he did was he used what's called a wax resin adhesive, and it's a, a, it's a traditional adhesive that's been used since about the 17th century in, uh, in the Netherlands, in Holland. Um, it's basically wax and a, and a tree resin, and um, it, you know, it, uh, it's applied to the back of the painting, it's applied to whatever su uh, support you're putting it on. And uh, at this time, they would have been using probably warm, hot irons to adhere the, the two surfaces together. So basically melting that adhesive to bond the canvas to the panel. And there are all sorts of other sort of ways of doing this, but this was a traditional way of doing it. Typically, they were, you know, a painting like this or, or any other painting would have been mounted onto another canvas support. And the reason you would do that is if it had uh, a lot of planar distortions, and I'm gonna show you some of that as we move along, or there are tears and you wanna make sure that everything holds down. So you apply a new fabric to the back of the original to make it flat and in plane again, the way it was intended. So, uh, it's gonna play, there we are. Now, what I wanna do is give you two examples of uh, paintings that we've done in the last five or six years of reversing uh, what I mean by reversing is actually taking these original canvases off of these aluminum supports. And these two paintings that I'm gonna show were paintings that were done by uh, Kleeman himself. And the first one is this Morton Schamberg painting from the uh, Rose Art Museum. Actually, it's the first one we did, and it's small. It's only 19 inches by 15 inches. Painted in 1916. And this painting was interesting because uh, the canvas was well adhered to the aluminum sheet. But um, one, of the, one of the negative side effects of using wax resin, especially on modern paintings like this one, which uh, rely on um, lighter colors, uh, a canvas that shows through a very much more transparent surface, um, what it does is it actually darkens the painting. It, it, it gets into everything and takes it down several values of, of, uh, of, of uh, color and grayness. So one of the concerns the Rose Art Museum had was how darkened the painting looked, and they were uh, looking to loan it, and what could we do about it? So um, what we did, and this is actually a detail uh, of my colleague, uh, Corinne Long, who works with me, what they would also do is they would hide the aluminum uh, with another piece of canvas on the back of it. So from the back, it looked like a canvas painting that had been lined onto canvas, except it's very stiff. stiff. It's like a, basically like a placemat is what it sounds like. And here you can actually see the aluminum sheet sort of coming to into vision. And, and these, this yellow kind of material, that's the wax resin adhesive that's still stuck to both surfaces. So the first step is basically removing the, the, the backing off of it. Um, and then what we did here was, um, it was quite well bonded to it, but what we did was use an infrared lamp from underneath it to warm up the aluminum. It retains the heat really well. And we gently started pulling the painting canvas painting off the surface and basically peeled it back. One of the negative uh, issues with using a rigid support like this is that typically you can't easily peel the, the backing off the painting. You would rather not be doing this 
you don't want to be peeling the painting away from the, the uh, support. You'd rather be taking, for example, a canvas off the back of the painting while it's laying flat so you don't cause any creases, wrinkles, or distortions. So uh, basically, we were quite successful in removing it. And here's the painting and Corinne holding it. And you can see through it how transparent it is. And a lot of that has to do with the wax and what effect it had on the painting. Um, and then uh, if we, the next image, the back of the painting, and it's now basically off the aluminum, but loaded with a lot of wax resin on the reverse of it. And the, the really uh, time consuming part of the process, which we're gonna have an issue with, uh, with your painting, our painting, because we have it right now, is the removal of this wax, because you can't re-adhere this onto another support without getting rid of as much of the wax as possible. So, uh, and here you see a detail, again, we're removing the wax from the front and from the back, because you want to basically return the painting to as quickly as, as much as possible to its original state. If you can get 98% of the wax out of that, you've done an amazing job, and I think we did that with this painting. And you can see, I think, in this next image, if it clicks. So here you see the painting before treatment and after treatment. And you can see, this is really more of an aesthetic treatment, but you can actually see how the background here was really darkened into a kind of a dark yellow kind of tone. And here the vibrance of the, of the canvas and you know, the, the actual paint is now much more uh, dramatic than it was originally. So this could have stayed on that support, but this was an aesthetic thing to really uh, improve the appearance of the painting, which is something that's actually gonna happen with with the, uh, the, the uh, Niger uh, painting also with the ship. Uh, did I do it that way or did I block it? Okay. Second painting I want to show you on a larger scale. This is a little over four feet by three feet wide. Is this Hyman Bloom painting um, from a private collection that also was mounted on aluminum. And this one actually ended up, uh, as I recall, being a, a much more sort of straightforward uh, thing. This one actually peeled off really easily for whatever reason. And th that has to do with the, the adhesives themselves. Different, at different times they were mixing different elements into it so the bond would be good or not good. This one was actually starting to peel away on its own. So it was a question of just putting the painting face down on, the, on, the, on this table and basically pulling it off. Actually the funny story here is uh, we were working uh, at my house on this uh, painting and uh, Courtney on the left and Corinne on the right who works with me, uh, we were about to start it and it was like early afternoon and I needed an espresso. So I go into the kitchen to make an espresso, and the two of them couldn't wait, and all of a sudden they shout, hey, we got it off. So, you know, they, they got their coffees too, but anyways, uh, it, was a, it, was a, it was a great moment because it just came off so beautifully. Um, and here again, uh, what I want to show with this image is the, uh, this is a detail of actually uh, applying solvent uh, to the back of the painting and actually having to lightly scrape off that excess uh, wax. That's the wax adhesive coming off, which I don't know to what degree we'll be doing it with the painting in, in this project, but it may be a part of the process. So you can just see that ad adhesive coming off. And the reason I'm showing this is uh, it's the painting after treatment and the reverse of the painting, now you see it's on a regular stretcher and just mounted onto a, lin a piece of linen canvas and as it should be like a canvas painting basically is the intent, which is what we're gonna do with uh, the, the ship Niger. So as Naomi mentioned, you know, the exhibition you had, uh, we, we came actually, uh, it's the first time we actually uh, met, I guess, wasn't it? We came to see the exhibition and talk about the, the painting. This was in January of 22. And here you see uh, Naomi and uh, my partner, Corinne, talking about it. And uh, it was a great moment to see them all and just realize what a huge project this was going to be and what an undertaking because the two paintings I showed you are typical things. They're just, you know, paintings of this size. Now we're talking about a completely different scale, and the logistics are very different in terms of what we need to do to, to approach it. The concept's the same, but it's just on a, on a much grander scale. So uh, quickly, uh, Kleeman, you know, what he did was he mounted it on the aluminum. They also had cleaned it. They applied a, a synthetic, uh, an early synthetic varnish, which has actually gone quite yellow. I think you can see the overall cast of the painting. It has a yellow tone to it. And this detail, if I'm remembering the order of my, yes. You can see um, a lot of creases and kind of uh, sort of uh, wrinkles in the painting, which has to do actually with the way the painting was manipulated when it was originally on its rolls and being rolled and unrolled. So, um, you know, it's a, it's a pretty fine cotton canvas support. So it's pretty susceptible to damage. You know, if you touch it, it, it you know, you can lose bits of paint on it. So they, they basically uh, re-adhered paint. Uh, oops, what happened there? Just this, 
Watch if the screen's going funky. That's okay. I don't know why it's doing that. I've lost like four fifths of my screen, but maybe look at the back. No, it's not going to. That's okay. I can see what's going on with the rest of it. So uh, the first order of business with the painting is to remove this yellowed varnish that's on the surface, uh, and we and we also know that there's wax that has penetrated to the front of the painting too. So that's part of the issue that you know we have to deal with. And here's Corinne actually doing some tests, and you can actually see the creases starting to appear. The uh, the restorations which are kind of dark and now are much more apparent as we remove the varnish and the over paint. So that's something that you know will have to be uh, dealt with. And what we've arrived at in terms of a cleaning technique, if it comes up, did I press it small enough? Maybe I didn't. <coughs> Try again. Oh, yeah, here it is. So what we're actually using is uh, what are called solvent gels, and they're just thickened, it's like a thickened paste with the solvents in there, and they basically go on the surface and don't penetrate too far. They just sit on the varnish, and you agitate it for a, a minute or so, and it, it just loosens the, the varnish. And you can see, I think, quite the dramatic change in terms of an area that's been cleaned versus what hasn't been cleaned. And again, the, in an area like this, a lot of these creases showing where the, the, the paint has, has been lost. So that's where, in, th in the process of doing right now, we're about three quarters of the way through, so we're making good progress on that. Um, and again, here's a, a sort of a detail showing the luminosity that we're starting to get with the clouds and the blue. We still have to go back here and chase more of the wax, and a lot of this will also improve when we get the painting off the back of that aluminum sheet, and we're able to clean the reverse of it, which has a lot of wax, which has penetrated the painting and made it darker from the reverse also. Um, so uh, it's not, this is not the end of the cleaning in terms of the improvement, but what we're suspecting you're gonna get is a really uh, much more dramatic, colorful, luminous surface, which is what the intention of the artist was. Now the fun part. So this is the bottom left corner, and you can actually see the, the signature here, uh, 1878. And here you see this aluminum surface, and it's interesting, you see these scratch marks in it. They were actually, because actually wax doesn't bond very well to metal. It's like, it's not a good bond. So they knew they had to like abrade this surface so that there would be better adhesion between it. But we've started prodding at the corners and, and sort of figuring out to what degree, uh, you know, the, the, what mechanical sort of process we're gonna go through to do it. And what we think is going to happen is we are actually, um, once the cleaning is all done on the front of the painting, we'll put it face up on uh, table surfaces and we'll probably release one end of it and start pu pu pulling that back, possibly with the use of some heat from underneath it, like with that lamp that I showed you, we have more of those. Um, and then what it, what's gonna happen is you're dealing with something that's over six feet wide you can't get enough bodies to control this. You don't want to do damage to the painting. So what we'll do is probably, as we're unrolling it, get it onto a sono tube, which is the construction forms that are used for foundations, and attach it to that, and then slowly start rolling that back, sort of backwards onto to the other end. And again, using heat if we have to, and other, any other sort of mechanical uh, sort of device. Um, and at that point, then what we'll do with uh, with the painting is unroll it so that it's now face down and we have access to the reverse of the painting where all that adhesive is, you know, is, is still on there and uh, do that cleanup work um, on the reverse. And then I think just a few <coughs> more slides. So I want to give you an example of, you know, why do we line paintings? This is a perfect example, this 19th century portrait uh, painting of two little girls. These distortions, these, this painting had been left in an attic or, or a basement, I think it was, and basically neglected for decades. And this is the reason why we have to do lining. Now again, Kleeman, I think, you know, went overboard with, the, with what he did with, the, with the, the panorama paintings, but there is sometimes a necessity to line paintings. And here you can see a condition that warrants that to actually apply a new piece of canvas to the reverse of it. And I have another image, which is not this painting, but when we come to the point of uh, lining the painting onto a new fabric support, what we'll be using is, is this table. Uh, it's much larger than what you're seeing here. It's actually a, you can see these, uh, it's perforated. It's actually uh, has heating elements and it draws air. So you can actually put the painting down with the, with the new canvas and a new adhesive, pull a suction on it, it goes under vacuum, it pulls it down, you warm it up to the correct temperature, it activates the adhesive and the two surfaces, the original canvas and the new canvas you're putting on the back of it is bonded to it. And this is what we'll uh, be doing with the, with the uh, panorama painting. So 
So this is just a detail of what we're doing. And this shiny, uh, sorry, the shiny stuff you see is this, this, this membrane that we put on it. It's called Dartex. It's a film that basically, uh, bless you, that seals it. So you, this, this shiny stuff you see here is this film covering it. So it's, it's a sealed vacuum uh, situation. And I think I only have, and here you see the, the painting I showed you before, the difference in terms of what a lining can do. Now fortunately, the, the, the panorama painting doesn't have these distortions anymore, but really the intent is to um, return it to a canvas painting again. It's not, a, it's not a, a, a wall painting, it's not a mural. It's a painting that needs to be on, and it won't be a heavy duty fabric, because it, it doesn't need that much support, but we'll put it on something pretty lightweight that will support the painting, and then uh, uh, order a, a specially fabricated um, stretcher, which will be much lighter than what we have now, and then it will be attached to that. And I think that's it. And that's all I have to say. And I don't know whether we're taking questions or whether I'm sitting down and we are taking questions. We are not taking questions. <laughs> I'm cut off. Thank you. Thank you, John Franco. Um, people will find you at the reception with questions. So John Franco is going to stay. He's going to have a glass of wine. I, we don't have espresso. I apologize, but perhaps a glass of wine. And you can ask him, pepper him with all the questions to your heart's desire. So thank you very much. We are grateful to you, Corinne, and your team for caring for our painting so beautifully. Thank you. So I do want to thank all of you as members who are joining us today here in person and so many virtually and being with us. Again, I have to underscore, you have sustained the museum in these past many years, but especially helped us thrive last year. And we're incredibly grateful. And there's so much for you as members to look forward to in the coming months ahead. From the return of the New Bedford Lyceum on June 9th, which is an incredible, I call it a community conversation. And this dates back, the Lyceum dates back to 1828. It's, it's older than the museum, founded in 1903, as um, a group of active citizens who wanted to get together and have what I call a community argument, but in a civil manner, and that's a good thing. So we've got a great um, speaker coming, George M. Johnson, and you can see more about that on our website and, and all those details, but come for a great community dialogue. We also will be opening, sadly, landscape came down, Naomi. It was an incredible run, um, but coming right in, and the Waddles Family Gallery will be the cultures of seaweed, and you are not going to want to miss that opening in another couple of weeks. And for those of you, who's ready to travel? Oh, come on, raise your hands. Who wants to go to France? Okay, yeah, let's go to France. So the museum's going to France in the fall for our members trip. We've got a group going to the Azores in another couple weeks. But to connect the coastal community of the south coast of Brittany, um, northwest France, and also thinking through the connections between food, between the culinary, between every aspect of seaweed, whether it was heating a house through insulation or people were figuring out how to eat and if you wanted to eat seaweed, people are figuring out how to eat seaweed. But Naomi is going to be leading this group, our members trip in the fall, to Brittany and Paris. And so you are not going to want to miss that. There's more information you can find out about it. And Naomi will build all those connections between here and, and Brittany and, and our whole seaweed connection. So look out for that. Um, do not miss the party of the season on July, 4, uh, July 15th. It is under the sea. You can see we've got a whole seaweed feel to this summer. Under the sea is the benefit, the annual summer benefit here at the museum. So come for that night, but also come for that whole weekend. On the 13th, we kick off that weekend with a whole series of um, fun family celebrations, also themed on seaweed. You're getting the trend, right? Um, and then be sure to watch for your member e-news for all these announcements of any of these programs that we've got. Our lecture series are back. Sailor series was a packed house just a few weeks ago. Our Portuguese and Lusophone World Series has been going strong through the pandemic. It continues to go strong, so always be checking out our program page on our website, but also our e-news that comes out weekly and monthly. So be sure to check out all of that. Um, and now... I am delighted to close this meeting with a major announcement. As members of the museum, you are getting this news first. 
Um, as many of you may know that the Whaling Museum has more than 2,500 whaling logbooks. Actually, I think it's 2,508, right, Naomi? Yep. So we have a lot. Um, you may not know that there's really only about 4,000 whaling logbooks in the entire world. So right here in New Bedford is more than 60% of the logbooks in the entire world. Um, what you may not know is that we have been trying to chip away at digitizing these logbooks so that they are available for anybody in pursuit of the incredible treasures of information that are within the logbooks and the journals, both for anyone with just curiosity or for scholars who are diving deep. Um, and so with a goal of open access for all, the Whaling Museum has increased our efforts in the last many years to digitize our logbook collection. And so far, I'm delighted to share with you that over 340 of them are fully digitized, transcribed, and accessible to all. So we're making progress on that 2,500. But we've got more work to do. Um, two scholars in our community, Caroline Umenhofer from Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution and Dr. Timothy Walker from UMass Dartmouth, have been studying historic maritime conditions for years and analyzing the data and disseminating their information to help with the impacts of climate change. As you can imagine, they are also frequent visitors to our reading room and our collection of logbooks as they do this deep examination. Thank you to Dr. Timothy Walker. I want to give a shout out <laughs> for joining us today. Thank you very much, Tim. And for Andrew Rose, who is representing Caroline, who could not be here from Woods Hole. Where's Andrew? There's Andrew. Thank you. So today with Timothy and Caroline, I am I'm honestly over the moon to announce a new project called eWhales a historic collaboration between these institutions, the three of us, fully digitizing our logbooks, studying this magnificent collection, and sharing the critical weather data for researchers right here and around the world. And to get this project moving forward, we are grateful to the Community Preservation Commission and the New Bedford City Council for their recent approval of community preservation funding that is gonna kickstart a lot of this effort. With this key first funding, we will take a giant step forward digitizing nearly half of our logbooks. It's a big day. <laughs> it's a big day. <laughs> and I'm so pleased that this all came together. We've signed the MOU. All three institutions are on board and we're, we're full speed ahead. And it came together in time that we could give you, our members, this inside secret. So now you know you've got all the inside information. Um, so now I hope you will join us in the Jacobs Family Gallery right through the doors where you can raise a glass to John Franco for his work. You can raise a glass to the museum. You can raise a glass to e-whales. <laughs> And importantly, raise a glass to yourselves as members for all that you do for the museum. Thank you. <laughs>